It is provincially mandated that the City of Toronto update its official plan, along with the rest of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. That perhaps sounds boring. It's anything but. How the capital city will grow over the next three decades and add almost three quarters of a million new residents? Well, that matters well beyond the city limits. With us for more, both from what we still like to call New City Hall. In the downtown core, Deputy Mayor and Toronto City Councillor for Davenport, Anna Bailao, who is also the Chair of the Planning and Housing Committee, and Greg Lintern, Chief Planner and Executive Director for Toronto City Planning. And we're delighted, I believe, for the first time to have both of you on our program tonight. So it's great to see you both. Um, Anna Bailao, get us started here. This review, as we suggested, is happening in municipalities all around the Greater Golden Horseshoe. What exactly is the directive to you from Queen's Park? Well, it's how we accommodate that growth um, in, in the city of Toronto. It's creating the vision uh, where that growth is going to go, where, where jobs are going to go, how they interact with transit. So it's a foundation document that will help us um, to um, address the future growth of the city, to respond to many applications that then will come, and, uh, and we'll set uh, values, vision, and a way forward to respond to the growth that is coming to the city. And Greg, the numbers are pretty big. Um, they're talking here about 700,000 more people living here within the next 30 years and 450,000 more jobs as well. How much, in your view, does Toronto need to change to accommodate those numbers? Well, they are big numbers, Steve, uh, and Toronto has always been changing to accommodate growth. We've accommodated, uh, I think it's around 600,000 uh, new residents uh, in the last uh, 25 years. Uh, so it's uh, it's an ever-evolving, ever-accommodating, uh, uh, I would say, uh, municipality. Uh, it's, it's important to kind of put this in the context of provincial policy, which calls for the city to um, look at a range of provincial policy around uh, infrastructure, around housing, around transportation, uh, the kind of place that we want to live in uh, when we wake up to all this in 2051, 30 years out. So it's, it's kind of important to think about the city that you design and the city that you get from that design and make some conscious decisions about, about how you want to accommodate that growth. And remember, you know, we talk a lot about population uh, as planners. We talk about population growth. We talk about jobs. But we also talk about all of the elements that keep it livable. Um, and and that, that is always a big challenge. Uh, it's almost easier to just talk about the population and the housing, but let alone uh, when, you, when you layer in the, the pipes that we need, the transportation you need, the community services we need. It is a complex challenge. We've risen to that challenge in the past, and uh, I'm confident that we'll continue to be able to do that. Well, let's put a map up now and show uh, our viewers, and I'll describe a little bit for those listening on podcast who can't see the map, uh, what we're talking about here. We can see some areas that have a ton of gro uh, growth, I guess what you guys call hyper-intensification, and it's mostly along line one of the subway system, the waterfront, some areas not far from downtown, Neighborhoods that are not right on the subway line, but still close to downtown, those are the ones mostly in pink, meaning fewer people live there now than 50 years ago, actually, some by more than 30%. Uh, now, Greg, let me follow up with you. From a planner's perspective, does this map make any sense to you? Well, you know, you have to, you have to keep it in perspective. The, the, uh, the growth plan that the city set out to uh, manage when it amalgamated uh, 25 years ago or so, uh, focus growth and change along uh, existing and planned transportation routes or transit routes. You know, the whole idea about building a walkable city is not new. And uh, the, the focus of that growth has been on those areas. Uh, and, and in fact, in, to some extent, has been very, very successful, as you point out, maybe too successful in some areas because of the uh, demands on infrastructure. But what's changed and what's important uh, to contextualize right now going forward is um, questions around affordability, questions around equity, questions around climate. Um, they were not as present in, in our mind's eye and in the conversation 25 years ago as they are now. And um, as ever with planning, you've you know, got to keep your eye on the future where we're going. You've got to keep your eye on really good uh, data and understand 
um, what kind of outcomes we want going forward. And th that challenges us. Uh, planning is about critical thinking. The conversation has to be about critical thinking. And that challenges us to consider, are there other ways that we can continue to accommodate more residents in other places? And, um, and that's one of the reasons why we're, we're looking at um, uh, different growth strategies going forward. All right, Anna Baila, let me ask you to follow up on that. There is a disparity in growth. You're a political leader in the capital city of the province. How would you like to see this disparity resolved in a better fashion? Uh, Steve, I think there's a disparity in growth and there's a, a, a disparity in equality in our city. Um, and I think with the pandemic, we actually can see that even better, the inequalities that exist in our city. If you put the pandemic um, uh, high uh, targeted areas or high affected areas with uh, the map for Professor Holchansky from, uh, uh, with the three cities, you can actually see uh, these where these inequalities happen um, and, and the correlation between these. And our growth plan and the way that we build this city can respond and can tackle some of those inequities. When Greg was talking about, you know, housing, about climate, about equity, these are things that now our plan needs to respond to. The way that we formulate um, uh, our vision and, and the policies that we create about where this growth is going to go, how it relates to transit, uh, creates opportunities for people in the city and responds to some of these inequities. So what I would like to see out of coming out of this growth pl plan is a big equity lens, is to have the growth uh, responding to and being correlated with this uh, opportunity to people in the city and making sure that we're not excluding people from neighborhoods, which um, sometimes people tend not to think that way, but our policies have excluded certain people from our neighborhoods. We're seeing lots of neighborhoods having a decrease in population because people are being pushed out of certain neighborhoods in our city. So the way that we think about our new plan needs to be the way that we want the city to grow and the kind of neighborhoods. Uh, and if we're truly seriously thinking about inclusive neighborhoods, we have to be uh, thinking differently in where this growth is going to happen and how this growth is going to happen. Well, let me get you to follow up, uh, Anna, in this respect. Uh, if I understand this properly, the vast majority of residential areas in the capital city of Ontario are zoned solely for single family housing. If that persists going forward, uh, it seems pretty clear to me we're not going to be able to accommodate the kind of growth that we need to accommodate. And one of the reasons that the city is zoned that way is, and I'm not looking at you specifically, but certainly there are politicians on city council uh, whose future elections depend on the status quo. So how does this get resolved? Uh, with dialogue, with consultation, with bringing the facts to people, and uh, the facts are that the city needs to accommodate another 700,000 people. The facts are there are certain areas in our neighborhood that are becoming inaccessible with the current zoning bylaws to the majority of Torontonians. Lots of people tell me today, I wouldn't be able to afford to live in the neighborhood where I grew up, where my parents live, or to buy my own house today. So is this the kind of city that we want to move uh, 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 to, and is this the kind of city that we will, we will want to build? I think that people are interested in having this conversation. I think that uh, we need to bring people that sometimes are not part of these conversations to the table. Um, the committee did ask uh, our, our uh, planning department to have um, a real strong effort to go and to reach out to communities that are usually not at the table when we have these conversations, uh, equity seeking groups, uh, making sure that uh, not only homeowners but renters are part of the conversation as well so that we can have an inclusive uh, discussion around the way that we plan this growth. But we have to understand that the majority of land, residential land, where we can build homes right now, today is zoned for single family homes. And if we are to keep and to respond to the growth that is coming, we need to have um, a, a different approach. We need to have housing options for people. And, and we've started some of this work. We're talking about laneway suites, garden suites, triplex, duplexes. This will help us to grow as a city so that we don't end up with having, you know, peaks of 80-story buildings and then just, you know, single-family homes. We have to have the conversation of 
what is in between? What what's that mid middle middle going to look like? Because that will also translate into having people um, being able to live in certain neighborhoods in our city and not excluding and pushing out people from these neighborhoods. That last point you made is exactly what I want to follow up with the chief planner on, and that is, uh, I sit here today in a studio that is at Young and Eglinton, right in the middle of Toronto. Uh, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to guess there's $2 billion worth of condo construction going up within a stone's throw of where I'm sitting right now. Uh, we're on a subway, subway line here. We're on an LRT line that'll be in it in the next couple of years. On the other hand, if you drive five minutes south, 10 minutes south, to the Danforth, they're on a subway line, and there is no major construction, anything comparable to what's happening here down there. Greg, how can that be? Why does that persist? Well, I think it's a bit of a simplification that there's nothing happening on our avenues uh, across the city. Uh, we've had a lot. I mean, the growth, the growth uh, strategy for the last uh, couple of decades has been to focus on, uh, as I said earlier, areas that have been um, connected or to existing or planned transit. So you've got mid-rise happening uh, on avenues. You've got a lot of development downtown and in our centers, North York, Scarborough, and Tobacco centers on the waterfront and other mixed-use areas. Um, yes, there is a slower evolution on some of our avenues, uh, but I wouldn't just look at, at the Danforth. I'd look at uh, uh, thousands of other mid-rise units that are being built across the city. And the degree of change is evolutionary. There's no question. You look at Bathurst and Bloor, for example, on the old Honest Ed site, uh, or you've got a significant uh, amount of change going on there that was accommodated through a really deep community conversation about the, the opportunity there for renewal, all rental housing, uh, a great uh, revitalization in that neighborhood on a large site that could that could take a lot of change. And the, 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 the transition um, may be slow for some, but the, the, I think the evidence is going in one direction around uh around intensifying our avenues and and working out um you know how we actually execute uh, uh intensification across the city in a broader way the 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 deputy mayor pointed out um you know you know finding that 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 middle uh in the city um you know in a low-rise scale in a four-story uh box uh, you can accommodate six eight ten units um and, and really not uh, see too much difference in terms of the overall scale that you would with a single family dwelling. Uh, so that accommodation of, uh, of change, uh, I think is, is, is something that we're hearing about from Torontonians. They want to see how we can accommodate uh, more choice, more ho housing options. You know, we, we just did a, a garden suites report, which is the next step in some of our uh, expanding ho housing options work. And uh, we published the, uh, the commentary from uh, 4,000 people that filled out a survey, 235 pages of commentary. We published it. And, uh, you know, close to two-thirds uh, of people were supportive or somewhat supportive of looking at new ideas like garden suites. What are they? For, for garden suites like uh, a small granny flat or a... Uh, you know, uh, somebody living above your garage or, or instead of uh, your garage taking up all of your, your uh, landscaping tools, you actually have a unit out there. Um, and it's the city's, we, the city's done laneway suites already. We've done secondary suites where you could have a suite in your basement. Um, no parking required. Uh, so quite, I, I think, quite progressive and quite um, evolutionary, as I said, for Toronto's neighbourhoods. Uh, having the conversation now about garden suites. But the point I wanted to make is that there is a lot of, uh, I think, pent-up interest and generational shift going on in the conversation around uh, around how we do it, finding new ways to do it in a, in a middle way where, uh, where, where you don't have those extremes, as many as those extremes that the deputy mayor uh, pointed out. You know, you're always going to have some tall buildings in Toronto. It's a North American city. You know, we, we're, we've gone down that path. Uh, we're not going to wish them away. Uh, how, to, how to do tall buildings is, is something that we focus on, how they meet the ground, how they work for the public realm, uh, and, and, and create livable environments is something that we try to focus on. But increasingly doing more of that on the avenues and, and, uh, and more of that in, in our neighborhoods uh, at different scales. 
Uh, right. it, it, wanna... is, it is it's, it's an interesting exercise. Right. I, I want to circle back to something that Deputy Mayor said a few moments ago, and that is, um, I guess you called it equity. Some other people call it the character of a neighborhood. It's, uh, it's something I think it's fair to say that a lot of city councilors want to protect, and it comes up during public consultations among those who want to fight developments, but they don't necessarily want to fight developments because of what they fear is too much scale. They want to fight these developments because they're not sure about the kinds of people who are going to be moving into their neighborhoods. I'm tiptoeing around this, but there are elements of, you know, there are elements of racism and inequity in some of these attitudes. Uh, I'm here. I don't want the character of my neighborhood, which I've enjoyed for the last 50 years, to change. That kind of attitude. Uh, Deputy Mayor, what expectation should somebody have that when they move into a neighborhood 10, 20, 30 years ago, or maybe even last year, what expectation should they have that the character, quote unquote, of that neighborhood is going to remain the same? Well, I, I always challenge that interpretation of character. Um, very, uh, when we're at community meetings, uh, a lot of people talk about the character of the neighborhood in terms of the built form. You know, this is the character of the neighborhood, the single family homes. And I think the, when we talk about the character of the neighborhood, it is really important that we talk about um, the people that have access to the neighborhood and that live in the neighborhood. And what I uh, try to have the conversation with residents is, uh, and, and they can relate to that, is that um, the character is changing quite a bit in lots of our neighborhoods. I represent a neighborhood that, yes, the physical character in most of our internal neighborhoods is the same. The homes have been there for 80 years. But the character of the people that have lived there has changed over the decades. Uh, used to be a very blue collar, working class neighborhood that today cannot afford to live in that neighborhood. So if we're truly interested in maintaining the character of the neighborhood, which at the end of the day, I think people do believe that it is also about the people, you might need to open that box that we have to have to accommodate the true character of our neighborhoods. Um, and, and when we have that conversation, I think people, especially now that issue, this issue is becoming so prevalent uh, in, in, in our communities, the, the, the access, the affordability, um, it, I think it, it, it makes people reflect a little bit more. Uh, it's still very difficult conversations. Uh, Change is difficult, right? Change is, is difficult. Mm. Uh, but when you bring the, that conversation and, and people reflect on their own families and they do realize how hard it is for a young family to start to buy their first home here in Toronto where when, or their young, young graduate to be able to afford to rent or to move out even here in Toronto, um, people uh, become a bit more open to these conversations and realize that yes, we, we truly need to have um, this conversation that we're having about our official plan that seems so boring, but when you bring it to the real life issues, we see that has a huge impact on the way that we live and that we will live in 10, 20, and 30 years in our city. Well, let me, do you mind if I push back a bit on that? No, you don't mind at all because you're a very open-minded person. No. Here we go. <laughs> um, public consultation, you've talked about consultations and these public consultations about new developments tend to bring out, on average, people who I think are wealthier, older, more likely to be retired, uh, not particularly enamored of change. They've lived in their neighborhoods for a very long time. They like the neighborhoods the way they are. They don't want neighborhoods to change. I live in this neighborhood, and I well remember people on my street circulating petitions saying, don't let them build 50, 60, and 70-story condominiums in this area. And I remember not signing those petitions because I thought, we need more people in this area. We can handle more people in this area. And uh, sure enough, uh, the new development has brought untold uh, wondrous things to this area. How are you going to be sure, Anna, that you hear from residents who perhaps are too busy living normal lives to attend these, you know, evening consultations uh, and who actually don't have any problems with the changes that are happening, but, uh, and, and therefore either can't attend or, or don't find it worthwhile attending these events? Steve, you're so right. That, that has been a problem that existed pre-pandemic. Now we've seen with the consultations that have uh, uh, become mostly online because we can't meet in person that we have a different kind of participation already. 
um, but there, there's still some people that are left out. So language barriers uh, exist and, and we need to address that. And, and what, when we approved the beginning of, of uh, the, uh, the study of, for the growth plan, uh, that is something that we asked our planning department to really um, um, uh, connect with um, uh, equity seeking groups. We're getting advice from leaders in this community because we do understand there's language barriers. There's time uh, barriers, there's access barriers. So some people, um, you know, it's easier for them now to go to public consultations online, right? Because you have kids, you have to put them to bed. If you have something online, it's probably easier. Others don't, they don't have access to that technology. So I think with this pandemic, one of the things that we see is that we have different ways and we should continue to explore these different ways. Technology, go to uh, places where usually we, we don't go to. Um, one of the big efforts, for example, with this growth plan is to actually target our um, and, and have conversations with indigenous communities and to have to ensure that uh, that uh, uh, they're a big part of this consultation, for example, which I don't think we've done enough of in the past as well. So um, I think we're, 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 we've learned a lot. We're still learning um, and there's still more that, that needs to be done. This official plan is one of the we're trying different methods. Um, we're hoping to to start to have in-person consultations in the near future. Um, but from having different languages, access to uh, do it yourself, so that even you know tenants associations, which sometimes are not as uh, uh, um, uh, able to to participate in some of these conversations. Uh, facilitate, give them the tools to have these consultations sometimes themselves in the environments where they feel more comfortable. And then we get this, uh, the results of the consultations. We're, we're really trying different methods to get at as much consultation as possible. And for example, I mean, the garden suites, we had 4,000 people participating in this survey. It was, it was quite significant, um, a, a number. It might not seem a, a big number for a lot of people, but uh, for us, it was, you know, in the middle of a pandemic to have 4,000 people taking the time to participate just on the survey itself. Uh, it shows that people are interested in this conversation and uh, and that we really need to uh, to make a big effort to reach to the different uh, uh, stakeholders here in our city. Okay, I appreciate hearing that because I, I well remember several years ago, there was a building across the road from where we're sitting right now. It was about three stories high. It was an Ontario government building and it took up a broad swath of land. I think it's where you went to get your OHIP card renewed. And it was mm -hmm. so unimaginative. Do you know what the name of that Ontario government building was? It was called Ontario Government Building. <laughs> I kid you not. It's gone now. There are condos, coffee shops, restaurants, all sorts of things that have replaced it. The neighborhood's better for it. Anyway, that's me on my soapbox. Never mind that. Let's move on. Uh, Greg Lintern, I want to ask you about a mismatch uh, that many people see in the city right now and ask what you can do about it. There are many seniors living in family-sized homes by themselves with lots of spare room in the basement or on the second floor or whatever. And there are many families living in one or two bedroom apartments and condos who are really squished in there. Is there something that can be done to resolve what appears to be a kind of a mismatch of supply and demand? Yeah, you know, a lot of empty bedrooms out there is what you're pointing out, Steve. Yeah. And uh, not, uh, you know, looking back in time, you see this generational turnover in the in the housing stock. And we've done some uh, kind of in-depth work uh, looking back at the trend line and looking forward, applying that trend line, at least on a demographic basis, one might expect uh, a significant amount of a turnover. Uh, I'll speak to, you know, my assumptions on that in a minute, but that that turnover can mean that uh, there's a there's a new supply of uh, uh, of housing that could come online for larger households. That being said, as you point out, there are there are a lot of people over 100,000 households that are underhoused. That there there may be a multi generational family living in in a in an apartment a unit that doesn't have enough bedrooms. So. Uh, Part, part of what the city is doing is pulling every lever it can through our housing action plan. Um, and what we can do uh, uh, is, is continue to support new construction. Certainly uh, we, won't, we won't meet all of the housing demand just with generational turnover. Um, direct role in the construction and development of affordable housing. 
Uh, that's something that the market won't necessarily uh, build. And the, the, uh, all of the different uh, direct initiatives that the city has taken up over the last couple of years with, with its own land to build uh, uh, more affordable housing, um, modular housing. Uh, there, there are just many, many levers that the city is pulling on now that it hasn't in the past. And, and to, get at, um, to get at some of that, um, uh, uh, er some of the areas of, of uh, supply that aren't being met by market-driven forces. Well, Anna, maybe you could tell me more about those levers because my pal John Michael McGrath, with whom I host the On Poly podcast, uh, recently wrote a piece in which he said, waiting for baby boomers to die is not effective housing policy. I think everybody agrees with that. So what levers can you pull Great. to try to fix this mismatch? I agree. So I think one of the first uh, things that we have to do is ensure that we build um, housing that seniors want to downsize to in their own communities. Um, so uh, that's why when you're talking about uh, where that growth is going to uh, happen, um, it, it is important that you look at neighborhoods and, and create the opportunities for those seniors to downsize. They don't want to leave their communities. Um, so I think that is an important uh, um, uh, part of it, that you need to create uh, the stock so that they can leave, you need to create incentives. Uh, so for example, in the consultation that Greg was talking about, about the garden suites, a lot of seniors say that um, they want to do the garden suite because they want to live in the garden suite and they want to uh, either rent or have their kids moving into the main house because now they have the, their kids have a bigger family than they do. So this is exactly the kind of policy that we need to create to incentivize and to facilitate to make it as easy as possible for seniors to see that this is uh, an advantage for them so they can make that stock available for them. And I think that two big components is make it the policy easy and making sure that we have the stock in their own communities uh, so that they can easily move uh, to, to smaller units and make those units available. Gotcha. We've got a couple of minutes left here and I want to see if I can get a quick answer from each of you on two separate issues. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Greg, on the issue that came up a couple of years ago when the mayor declared a climate emergency and directed the city to accelerate the city's climate action plan in the hopes of making some contribution uh, to staving off climate change. How does the climate plan affect the future growth of the city, in your view? Uh, I think it's fundamental to uh, the outcome that we all want. I spoke about waking up in 2051 and looking around and seeing what kind of city you're, you've got. Uh, we've got really ambitious climate goals. 65% uh, of 1990 uh, GHD reduction by 2030. <laughs> In the life of a city, that's right around the corner. Uh, how do you deal with that? You deal with it through uh, what, how you build buildings and how you retrofit buildings. But how you build new buildings is building them uh, in, in accordance with those new goals and ramping up as we have been over the last couple of years, ramping up those green development standards to make sure that new construction is working toward um, what is ultimately a net zero. The other part of that is transportation, uh, the other big uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitter. So having really robust local transportation networks that feed into regional transportation networks, um, making it easier to not use your car. Uh, not, that's not an anti-car statement, that's a pro a mobility statement. People are always gonna need to get around, but maybe they get around less. And fundamentally, the way you plan a city, I know you know, the 15-minute city is kind of an attractive slogan right now. But the way you build uh, and plan a city, if you build uh, working, living, you know, playing life uh, in close proximity, then you reduce your footprint. It's pretty simple. It may be hard to do. But uh, the more we can plan a city with proximity in mind around people moving around, and when you do need to move around, uh, it's a shorter distance to a much more robust transit network, a regional transit network, which is under construction, uh, which is finally catching up to where we should have been years ago. All right, last minute for the deputy mayor. It's no secret that the politicians on city council from the inner suburbs outnumber those of you who represent uh, the sort of old city of Toronto, the more downtown inner core of the city. In which case, what happens if all of these ideas that you've been enunciating here don't pass city council? Uh, Steve, I think that these ideas, most of them will uh, will come from the outside. Um, my And I say this because uh, when we dealt with the laneway housing, which um, had been tried a few years before in 2006 and then 
I led that effort with a colleague of mine and we brought it forward and there was a little bit of pushback. Um, and as soon as that happened, there was an outcry from people out there saying, you know, this is, it's time, we need to do this. Uh, and we had done a lot of work with organizations from outside City Hall. And when that outcry comes from outside City Hall, when people say, we need this, politicians do listen. And that's why this plan, this consultation is so important because this is about the city that we want to build and the city we want to live in in 2050. And I really hope that when Torontonians have that outcry that the politicians will listen so that we can truly have a plan that tackles equity and that uh, manages the change in a way that builds a city that we can be proud of. Toronto.ca forward slash our plan for more information. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to have the Deputy Mayor Anna Bailao and Chief Planner Greg Lintern on our program tonight, an issue which we are very interested in and will watch with continuing fascination. Thanks to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.